more and they're connected. In the last mini lecture, we studied the conjunction represented by the ampersand symbol and which corresponds in English, more or less, to and. This connective takes any two sentences and joins them, and each of the component sentences is called a conjunct. Um, this slide should say conjunction, not disjunction. And if you will remember, uh, the ampersand can be completely defined in propositional logic by means of a truth table. So a conjunction is true just in case its two conjuncts are true and is false otherwise. Now we'll deal with another connective, that is junction, or V. This corresponds, again, more or less, to the English OR, or either OR, at least in some of its uses. Just like the ampersand, the V takes two sentences to make a more complex one. Each of the component sentences is called a disjunct. The interpretation of the V in propositional logic can be completely defined by means of a truth table, just as it happens with a conjunction. So let's fill the truth table. We know that a sentence with either or is false if its two components are false. So if I say either I will eat eggs or I will eat ham, but in the end it turns out that I didn't eat eggs and I didn't eat ham, then um, the disjunction sentences, the first that I said, was false. However, if I go for one of the alternatives, the disjunctive statement will be true. For instance, if I ate ham but not eggs, then the statement either I will eat eggs or I will eat ham will be true. And the same happens if I don't eat ham but eat eggs. So the most interesting case is the first row. So what happens if I eat both ham and eggs? More generally, what happens when both disjuncts are true? In propositional logic, the convention is that when both disjuncts are true, then the statement formed with the disjunction is also true. That means that the disjunctive statement is false only when both disjuncts are false and true otherwise. As you can see, this is exactly the opposite of the conjunction, which is true only when both conjuncts are true. So if you keep on studying propositional logic, you'll see that this symmetry is quite useful. In general, there are two ways of understanding a disjunction, an inclusive one and an exclusive one. An inclusive disjunction is true if at least one of the disjuncts is true, and this, ex this includes the case in which both are true. An example of the inclusive use would be this. Suppose that your academic advisor tells you, to fulfill this requirement for graduation, you can take class A, which is taught in spring, or class B, which is taught in fall. So, if you take one of them and pass it, you'll be able to graduate. But if you decide to take both, it doesn't matter. You will graduate too. So, in this inclusive sense, the truth of the disjunction as a whole is guaranteed if at least one of the disjuncts is true. In the case of an exclusive disjunction, it must be the case that exactly one of the disjuncts is true for the whole, for the whole sentence to be true. So, if both are true or both are false, the sentence is false. So you see that the main difference with the inclusive case is what happens when both disjuncts are true. In the inclusive case, the disjunction is true. In the inclusive, in exclusive case, it is false. An example of the exclusive use is the following. Suppose that you do a job for a clothing store. Then, in discussing your remuneration, they tell you, here's how you'll be compensated. You can either get paid $300 or you can uh, get $400 in clothes. The understanding here, of course, is that you have to take one of the options, and that you can't take both. So again, in propositional logic, we interpret the disjunction, symbolized by the V, as inclusive. So a disjunctive statement is true whenever at least one of the disjuncts is true. Here's a bit of background. Although in English, or can be interpreted inclusively or exclusively, depending on the situation, in Latin they had different words for each of the senses. So, to express the inclusive sense, they had the word vel, and to express the exclusive one, they had out. So you could say that, in propositional logic, disjunction corresponds to vel, not to out. And so you can see that our disjunction symbols is a v, as in vel.
Back to the connectives. The last one of our basic set of connectives is negation, symbolized by the tilde. Now, negation shouldn't really be called a connective because it doesn't connect pairs of sentences, but only takes one at a time. So it would be more appropriate simply to call it an operator. But to simplify things, we'll keep on calling it a connective. The precise meaning of the tilde can be given by saying that it takes a sentence and then adds the phrase, it is not the case that, at the beginning of the sentence. So if you have a sentence such as Al works, the effect of adding the tilde is something like, it is not the case that Al works, which is the same as saying that Al does not work, or simply that Al doesn't work. Again, the meaning of the tilde is completely captured by a truth table. If the original sentence is true, then the effect of adding the tilde is a false sentence. And the opposite happens when you start with a false sentence. So what the tilde does is simply to invert the truth value of the original sentence. And of course, this makes sense. If Al works is true, then Al doesn't work is false. And if Beth thinks is false, then Beth doesn't sing is true. Now let's consider conjunction, disjunction, and negation together. Here we can see that the sentences in blue are instances of the form tilde p, but the other ones are not. This is because you can get each of the blue sentences from the form by substituting a sentence for p. Let's again visualize the role of p as a placeholder by seeing it as a box where you can stick sentences. So suppose that p is Al sings. Now let's focus on the first sentence, number one. Here you can see that to get that first blue sentence, you can substitute P with a sentence Al sings. Or if you want to abbreviate, we can represent Al sings with a letter A, with the result that we get tilde A. Something similar happens with sentence two where the substitution is with Beth likes lizards, or with B, its abbreviation. Now in sentence three is neither Bob nor Claire play tennis, which of course is a negation of either Bob or Claire play tennis, which is itself a compound sentence. So the sentence either Bob plays tennis or Claire plays tennis is a disjunction, but Let's not worry about that at the moment. Let's empty our box for a sec. So suppose that we abbreviate Bob plays tennis with B and Claire plays tennis with C. So the sentence that we want to negate is going to be B or C, right? And again, we can eliminate the OR and just write the V. So if we insert BVC right, in the box, which is the same as substituting P with uh, B or C, then we have uh, the resulting sentence. And we see that it does fit um, the form. right? So this is basically a representation of neither Bob nor Claire play tennis, because it's the negation of B or C which is either Bob or Clay play tennis. And so we see that um, if we let P be the entire content in the box, we see that this sentence does fit um, the prepositional form tilde P. Now let's do the same, but with the general form of the disjunction, it is P, V, Q. So again, we have identified a group of sentences that fit the form and another group that doesn't. Let's consider the sentence Al sings or Beth works. And once again, let's take P and Q as placeholders, which we represent with a square and a circle, respectively, connected by a V. So we substitute P with Al sings, which is the same as inserting Al sings in the square box. And we substitute Q with Beth works. Uh, which again is the same as uh, we're representing it as um, as putting the sentence Beth works in the circular box.
or elliptic box. And by doing that, we get Alsings or Beth works. Again, we can make it uh, shorter. Suppose that uh, we abbreviate Alsings with A and Beth works with B, right? And then we we um, substitute P with A and Q with B, and so we get A or B, which of course is an instance of the form P V Q. Now let's take the sentence. Either Al plays and Bill dances, or Claire jogs. And uh, we'll abbreviate Al plays with A, Bill dances with B, and Claire jogs with C. So the, the issue is, does this sentence fit the general form of the disjunction represented here by P or Q? Now we have to identify the main connective. And um, we can see this, this is where the main break in the sentence occur. And uh, the comma gives us a clue. So you see that we have two main sentences or two sentences that are connected by or. The first sentence is Al plays and builds sentence in build dances. And the second one is Claire jogs. So we can separate these two components that are gonna be disjuncts with brackets. Now, if we look at the left, um, the left disjunct, which is Al plays and Bill dances, we see that it's, it's not a, a simple sentence, it is a compound sentence, right? And um, the main connective here is and, so it is a conjunction. And here we mark it and we identify it, so we'll eventually gonna substitute this and with the ampersand. By the way, by the way here in, this, uh, in the sentence, the left bracket, should be before Al, not before either. So we know that Al plays is uh, symbolized by A, and the build dances, it corresponds to B, and that and corresponds to the ampersand symbol, right? So we can represent the left disjunct as A ampersand B, right? And so we put it in the box, right? In the left box, and that would be exactly the place occupies by P. So this is just equivalent to replacing P with A ampersand B. The right disjunct, that is whatever is to the right of OR, is clear jugs, which is simply the letter C. And so we put it in the left box, right? Which corresponds to Q. So it is as if we substituted Q with C. And the result of making this substitution is um, A and B or C, right? Which is our compact representation of either Al plays and Bill dances or Claire jogs. So um, we see that this sentence does fit the general form from this junction, right? So P would be um, substituted with Al plays and Bill dances, and Q would be substituted with Claire jogs. And then you only have the uh, V, right, in the middle. So again, and take it into account that A is Al place and that B is Bill dances and C is Claire Jogs, we see that how we can get um, A, B, or C by uniform substitution of uh, letters by letters, right? We can get from the general form P, V, Q to our sentence. So a and B or C is actually a substitution instance of P, V, Q, right? And so, in a derivative way, the sentence either I'll place and build dances or clear jog is also a substitution instance of the general form of this junction, right? P, V, Q. Now, an exercise. Let's see which of the sentences in the right column are substitution instances of the propositional form in the left. So you can do it um, on your own. So if you want, just pause the video. Well, you can see that only the third, not A and B, is a substitution instance of the propositional form. And you get, you get that sentence by substituting P with A 
and substituting P with um, Q with B. Um, the other ones um, are not substitution instances because you can get to them from the propositional form by making uniform replacements. Okay, now the propositional form is going to be the negation of a disjunction. And let's see which of the sentences to the right is the substitution instances of this form. So again, if you want, just pause the video. Okay, here, the only sentence that actually fits the form is the second, not A or B. Now let's test the validity of some argument forms involving disjunction and negation. There is a well-known pattern of argument or argument form called disjunctive syllogism, also known process of elimination. An example of that is this. Either Al works or Beth works. Two, Al doesn't work, therefore Beth works. And so we can see that um, this is a valid pattern of argument. The disjunctive syllogism comes in two forms one in which we deny the left disjunct and one in which we deny the right disjunct. In any case, the uh, result is always the same, right? Um, we negate one disjunct and then we conclude the other disjunct. So let's see, let's check the validity of these forms by means of a truth table. So here we have P or Q, not P, therefore Q. And so we have um, the two columns for the two components, P, Q, and then for each of the premises and for the conclusion, we have a column, right? So the premises are P or Q and the other premise is not P, right? So it's good if you start with uh, the shorter uh, sentences. For instance, let's give a column for not P. And so um, basically what is that is going to do is simply um, simply um, revert the values for P, right? Whenever P is 2, not P is going to be F. Okay. Now it's 1. Let's do the one for uh, P or Q. Well, you know that P or Q is only going to be false when both P and Q are false. In any other case, it's going to be true. And the conclusion is the conclusion is Q, right? So we just, we just uh, repeat um, the second column. In the topmost truth table, we see that um, with respect to the first argument, there's only one row in which both premises are true. That is the third row, right? Not P, P or Q are true. And so what happens to the conclusion? Well, the conclusion is also true. So that means that the argument doesn't have any counterexamples, so it's valid. The argument form, I mean. And the same happens with uh, the other form. You know, we have P or Q, and then the other premise is not Q, and the conclusion is P. And uh, there is only one case, that is one row, in which both premises are true. And that is the second row. And it also happens that the conclusion is true at that very same row. So the argument is valid, too. And what about this argument form? P or Q? P, therefore not Q. Now this is very similar to the disjunctive syllogism form, but is it valid? So let's do the truth table. So we have again P, Q, then we have one column for each of the premises, P or Q, and then P. And then the last column is for not Q, which is um, the conclusion. So again, P or Q, uh, we get a T whenever at least P or Q is true. P is already the first column, which is repeated. And uh, not Q is simply Q uh, with inverted values, right? And so notice that um, there are three candidates to be a counterexample, right? which are the first three rows. In all of them, both premises are true. So we have to see what happens to the conclusion. Well, we see that in both the first and um, the third row, whereas the premises are true, the conclusion is false, right? Here I'm underlining the third, but I could have underlined uh, the first one, it doesn't matter. 
it's enough that there is one. So uh, both one and three give us a counterexample to this argument form. So that means that it is possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. So the argument is invalid. Okay, so let's stop here.